Tonight we'd like to deal with that great commission as given by Jesus Christ on that mountain near Jerusalem, just prerequisite to his ascension back to heaven. If you notice in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 through 20, and Jesus Christ came and spake unto them, saying, All authority, all power is given unto me in the heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. In Mark the 16th chapter, in verse 15 and 16, he said unto them, Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In Luke 24 and verse 46 and 47, And said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behoove Christ to suffer, And to rise from the dead the third day, And that repentance and remission of sin Should be preached in his name among all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then in John chapter 20, and beginning at verse 20, the Bible say, And he breathed on them, and received you the Holy Spirit, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And in verse 23 he said, And whosoever sin you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sin you retain, they are retained. Then in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible say, Ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the utmost part of the earth. Now these are the five accounts of the Great Commission as given by Jesus Christ. Let us notice in Matthew's version, he said, All power is given unto me, both in the heaven and in earth, go. Now we understand in studying the Bible, there are generic commands and there are specific commands, and there is primary authority and delegated authority. So we understand here, go is generic because not, it doesn't specify the method of transportation, but the command is to go. I'm sure that most of the people here this evening have local congregations, but they are here to encourage those who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 3 and the verse is number 18. Let us notice what God said. When I say unto the wicked that thou shalt surely die, and thou fail to give him warning. The brethren get it just a moment. You have it? Ezekiel chapter 3 and the verse is number 18. <laughs> when I say unto the wicked, that thou shalt surely die, and thou giveth him not warning, nor speaketh the one the wicked from his wicked ways, to save his life. Now the purpose of warning is to save his life. He said the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. The resp Whoa, just for one moment. The responsibility of carrying this message rest upon the Lord's church. This responsibility haven't been given to any ladies age society. It rests upon the members of the body of Christ. He said, yet if thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wicked ways, he shall die in iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So Jesus said, go and teach uh, make disciples of all the nation, and then baptizing them, those individuals who have been taught, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I recognize that there's a controversy in our society today. They're saying, Brother Evan, if you baptize into the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, that Peter didn't do that on the day of Pentecost. But let me tell you something. Peter was not in the act of baptizing. Peter was in the act of preaching. 
He said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that the same Jesus who take a wicked hand and before the determinate council and born of the throne of God, you have crucified him and slain him. But God would not suffer his flesh to corruption, nor leave his soul in hell, but raised him up from the dead and made him both Lord and Christ. And the Bible said, so when they heard this, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Now let's notice now. Jesus Christ told them what to do. And if the apostles did not baptize into the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, they did not carry out the Great Commission. And I believe that they carried out the Great Commission and they did exactly what Christ told them to do. But Christ didn't tell them to say anything. He said doing it. Baptizing is an active verb. He didn't say saying it. He said doing it. Baptizing them into the name. We're baptized into a relationship. And if a person is properly taught or scripturally taught, it is necessary for the person doing the baptizing to say anything. And whatever it is said, it is not for the benefit of the person who has been properly taught, but for the benefit of others. He said, baptizing them and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. But in Mark's version, he's more specific. He said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. I was in a meeting some time ago, and a man said, Brother Evans, he said, now, in Matthew, he said, go teach. In Mark, he said, go preach. Now, what's the difference? None. In a man who mounts the pulpit and calls himself preaching, if he doesn't teach anything, he hasn't done very much preaching. Hmm? He said, preach the gospel to every creature, and there's only one gospel to be preached. Just one. He didn't say preach a gospel. He didn't say preach one of the gospels, but preach the gospel to every creature. And Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, and beginning at verse 6, he said, I marvel that your soul soon removed from him that called to the grace of Christ unto another gospel. But Paul said, there's not another, but there be some which trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He said, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be an anathema or let him be a curse. What he's saying if with this evening, if it was possible for even an angel from heaven to come down to this earth and preach something different, that what was preached by Paul and other inspired men of God, you have an angel that will never see God's face in peace again. For the Bible says in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5, For God spared not the angel that sinned, but cast them down into chains of darkness to be reserved under the judgment. But I'm so glad Paul didn't stop there. He goes farther. He says, we've said before, so say I now again. If any man, I don't care about the number of degrees he may have hanging on his wall. I don't care about the pigmentation of his skin. I don't care about his social or political standing in the society and the amount of money he have on the money market, the kind of car he drives, or the kind of house he live in. The Bible says if any man preach any of the gospel to you, then that you receive, let him be an anathema or let him be a curse. But why is it so necessary to preach the gospel of Christ? Because the gospel of Christ is God's only power to save humanity. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and beginning at verse 16, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power, not a power, not some power. It is the power of God unto salvation. We all are familiar with power, aren't we? We understand that water is God's power to quell hunger. But you can add salt to it. Well, thirst won't quench, won't quench thirst, will it? Bread is God's power to quell hunger. But you can add cyanide to it and that biscuit will kill you. What I'm saying is it must be preached here. Oh yes, that's what he's saying. 
is God's power. We talk about power under salvation. We talk about justification. Man being made righteous in the sight of God. And God makes man righteous by forgiving him of his sins. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the condition of which God forgives sin is set forth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We understand and you can't feel and know that you're saved. A lady whose souls can't go in the fabric shop and pick up a piece of material, tell the lady I need three and a half yards, and suppose the lady put off a little bit and pat herself in the bosom, say, I feel like you've got it. Well, my wife is in the audience. I know what she'd ask her. How do you know? Well, I feel it. She said, no, you better measure it. Huh? You can't go in the meat market and guess and feel and know you've got two pounds of meat. A man out over here at Huntsville Penitentiary can't come to the warden some morning morning and say, Warden, let me out of this joint. I'm a free man. I know, I think I know what the warden would ask him. How do you know you're a free man? He said, Warden, I feel it here in my heart. I feel it in my, I feel it in my bosom. He could pat in his bosom and fall dead behind those bars. But I tell you what, if he walked down to the warden one morning with a signed pardon, signed by the governor of the state of Texas and the board of pardon and handed it to the warden, he said, open the gates and let him out here of evidence. So you can't feel and know that you're saved or justified in the sight of God. You must have some evidence and the only evidence we have is what the Bible says. This is the only evidence we have. Bible says God's power unto salvation. He said, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What are you talking about? It's God's righteousness because God grants it. It comes forth from God. God imparts it, but it's predicated upon whether or not we comply with condition as set forth in his will. It's, it's, that's right, it's conditional. And those conditions are set forth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the gospel is referred to as a will. Bible tells in Hebrews 9 referred to as a testament. Then in Hebrews 10 and verse 10 referred to as a will. And we all are familiar with wills, aren't we? Most of us are. We're familiar with. There are certain things that goes into the making of a will. First of all, there must be a testator. That's the person who makes the will. Now there are two things which must be characteristic of the person making that will. They must be of legal age and of sound mind. A child under age can't make a will. An insane person can't make a will. And then you must have something to bequeath. I think that's the legal term. You must have something to offer. If you don't have anything, you can't make no will. So you must have something to offer. No one makes an unconditional will. You, those conditions must be set forth in plain, simple terms, whereby the wishes of the testator would be carried out after the death of the person who made it. And as long as that testator lives, that will isn't enforced. You can do whatever you want with whatever you have as long as you live, but once you die, you speak through that instrument known as a will, so it takes the death of the testator before the will becomes effective. And then that will must be probated. It must be approved by the court. Administrators are appointed, and those persons named in that will as as a beneficiary receive whatever is set forth in that will according condition of the testator prerequisite to his or her death. Christ was of legal age. The Bible showed when he was baptized by the hand of John, he was about 30 years old. I think that's pretty legal, isn't it? And out of all the things Christ's enemies said about him, they never called him insane. They called him a glutterant man. They called him a wine bibble. They called him a friend of sinners. They said he cast out devils in the name of Beelzebub, the prince of devils, but they never called him insane. So meet the criteria, doesn't it? Right age and of sound mind. And thus we understand they have something to offer. He's offering us forgiveness of our sins. He's offering us the gift of the Spirit. And life in this, an abundant life in this life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. Abundant living is in Christ. There are a lot of people living in fine homes and driving fine cars, have money in the bank, but they're not living an abundant life because abundant living is in Christ. 
He offered that. And then he offers a home in heaven beyond this veil of tears when this life is over. And it's all set forth in the will. But it took the death of the testator before this will could become effective. Bible tell him in Hebrews chapter 9 and beginning to verse 15. And for this cause, he Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression, that one of the first testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. But where testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Christ died on that cross, stayed in that tomb for three, and a half, three days and three nights, resurrected from the grave stayed around here for about 40 days ascended to heaven where the will was probated in heaven's court. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14 I saw in the night vision and behold one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days which is God Almighty and they brought him near before him that was given him glory, dominion and a kingdom that all people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion of that dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. After that will had been probated in heaven, ten days later, he sent the Holy Spirit upon the apostles who were patient awaiting in the city of Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit gave the apostles power to become executors of this divine will. Every man, woman, boy, and girl who comply with condition become heirs of heaven's estate. They become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So therefore the condition is set forth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us notice now there's the priest think of what about those who fail to obey it. In Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and beginning at verse 6 the Bible says seeing is the righteous thing with God to reckon with tribulation of them that trouble you. And that you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now we find that he told him to go and preach to every creature. Is God's only power to save, and the eternal destruction awaits every man, woman, boy, girl who fails to obey it. Now tonight, if we can find out briefly just what they preach, I will understand what every other gospel preacher must preach in order to be pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God. Understand that prerequisite to the second chapter of the book of Acts, that the gospel had existed in promise. It had existed in purpose. It existed in prophecy. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the preparatorial stage and the very first perfected gospel sermon was preached on the day of Pentecost at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thus the Bible said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the altar got the one place and one accord and suddenly there came a sound from heaven after a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And the Bible said there appeared them cloven, a divided tongue like the fire, and set up on each of them. They was all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the Bible said there were devils at Jerusalem, Jew devout men out of every nation under heaven. This thing when all the brawl, the multitude came together. And what confounds it wasn't meaning this. And all these we speak Galilean. Have every man speak in our own tongue wherein we were born. He said, Parthian, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, and Pamphylia, out of Egypt, Latin, about Serene, Strain, Rome, Jews, and proselyte, priests, and raven, do you hear them speak in our own tongue? The wonderful words of God, others began to moke, saying, These men are full of the wine. Peter standing up with the eleven said, These men are not drunk, and as he supposed, seeing the birth the third hour of the day, are uh, just nine o'clock in the morning. But this is the which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
It shall come to pass in the last days, said God. I will pour out my spirit and all flesh. Your son and daughter shall prophesy. Old men dream, dream. Young men see vision. That they are for my spirit. And they shall prophesy. So serve him to burn wonders. Earth will leave blood and fire. And vapors will before that great nobody of the Lord shall come. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.